Welcome to the new extra runde of Biathlon with Ron and Hendrik. Today, the interview with Dola Holm Lagreit. From zero to hero. His thoughts about winning the Crystal Globe and what is he aiming for at the World Championships. Special episode number seven and we are back with the next Norwegian guest and it's none other than Stuala Holm Lagreit this time, Hendrik. That's correct, Ron. And um, the young Norwegian is the second in the overall World Cup ranking at the moment um, and I think uh, he might be able to challenge Johannes for the big crystal globe. Yeah, I think so too. And he right now is the second best shooter in the World Cup right behind Simon Eder from Austria. And the eight fastest skier in the whole World Cup field. Mm -hmm. So I'd say you got all you need uh, to be one of the best one day. For sure. And he wasn't like the guy we've all expected on top of the field this season. So his increase in performance is just incredible to me. And his worst result ever in his whole career, Hendrik, is also pretty amazing to me, at least. Exactly, Ron. But uh, let's not talk anymore. Um, you will hear this and, uh, of course, much more in this episode with Stolholm Le Greit. So so, um, yeah, give it a listen. Yeah, I'd say so too. So, Henrik, let's jump right in and we wish you a lot of fun with this episode and with Stuhla Holm Lagreit. So, Stuhla, it's a pleasure to have you here in our show and thank you for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Stuhla, great that you're here. So, um, today, you know, the European Championships in the Sneaky started and we saw that last year you also participated at the European Championships and uh, you won the silver medal in the pursuit and I'd say from that point on your career, yeah, how could you say it, it skyrocketed to the, to the moon or something like that. <laughs> so it's a, yeah. like the classic zero to hero story and I think you heard that a lot lately. But um, maybe first let's talk about how did it come that you decided to become a biathlete? Yeah, well, then we have to go back to my early childhood because, yeah, in Norway, winter sport is so popular on TV. And yeah. I was uh, very fond of watching both cross country skiing and biathlon on TV. Uh, and I had like Ola and Arbjorn Dolan was my idol. And yeah. uh, these guys were like legends. So <laughs> I wanted to be one myself. But uh, I didn't start with biathlon until I was 10 years old mm -hmm. because there's friction with uh, with the firearm so you have to be at least 10 years old to be allowed so yeah but uh, yeah I didn't uh, only do biathlon I did uh, also cross country and some soccer and or football as you say in Europe or yeah, yeah. and uh, I did some uh, bandy it's a uh, it's sort of ice skating uh, similar to hockey but uh, okay. yeah, <laughs> with a round uh, ball and uh, a bent stick Uh, and I also did Taekwondo. So yeah, uh, Biathlon was just one of many sports. I did that too. That Taekwondo, I, I did it too, yeah. <laughs> did? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did Taekwondo quite uh, long, actually. I, I quit when I was yeah, when I was 15, 16. I decided yeah. to only do Biathlon. So mm -hmm. from that point onwards, I was, you know, trying to become the best. So you're still pretty athletic and uh, pretty stretchy, right? I was, but, uh, you know, after a few years without Taekwondo, you, you suddenly get stiff yeah. all over the body. So <laughs> I know that, I yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah, but I think um, biathlete was a wise decision, as we um, know today. But when we looked uh, for your achievements in biathlon, we saw that you had uh, not much international uh, experience in front of your World Cup debut last season. Um, so where have you uh, done your races in those years uh, for, let's say, uh, yeah, 2016 to 2019? Yeah, uh, well... I was uh, sort of the late bloomer, like my, my yeah. form and my shape was always better towards the end. And in Norway, it's uh, so difficult to qualify for, for the junior world champs because you have to be in shape in early December. And I was living in Oslo where the snow is coming late. So the other guys always had an advantage the first races. Uh -uh. So I didn't uh, participate in world champs until 2018, actually, my last year as a junior. But uh, the other years before, I was uh, winning the Norwegian Cup in total each year, like 16, 17, or the three first year I won the Junior Cup. So mm -hmm. I wasn't like a bad biathlete, but I was, you know, in shape too, too late. So yeah, I, but my first world chance went quite well. I took a silver on the individual yeah. and we took a silver in the relay. And I also had a fourth and eighth in the sprint pursuit. So it was a good start on my international career, but uh Just a few months after the Junior World Champs, uh, I got the sickness mononucleosis. 
Ah, okay. And uh, that's the reason why my career had a small, uh, small road bump because uh, yeah, I I was uh, my my doctor uh, that I had through the federation. He he's been, he's been experienced with the, the sickness, so he knows that a lot of athletes they start to train too early. So his uh, motto was to to wait long, and um, that's what we did. I waited uh, until my body was. Uh, recovered yeah. and it took eight months before I could start training normal again. Oh, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, eight months without training that's that's not good, good for your shape. Uh, so yeah, especially at that age, I think. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So it was just after that, uh, a struggle to come back in into the shape. And uh, yeah, last season I was closing in, I was better, mm-hmm. but uh, still I had some uh, a way to go. But uh, I managed to qualify for the IBU Cup in. Martel in late mm-hmm. uh, January, and yeah, from that point on onwards, he was just you know rocketing my career. Yeah, of course. So um, early on, already pretty good signs, I'd say for you, if I hear that. I mean, it's also quite tough to get into the Norwegian A team or even the B team, I think. So was that also a problem for you to get into that team because you only had those two appearances? I mean, uh, your illness wasn't, I think, from 2016 to 2018, right? Yeah, my illness was just from 2018 to 2019. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, but I was in the junior team, the Norwegian junior team. So I wasn't, uh, yeah, I was still in, in the Federation's mm-hmm. warmth, you know. They were, they knew who I, who I was and they knew my history. So I think that, uh, yeah, that helped me get into the elite team because they knew that my potential is maybe good as it was before. Uh, but yeah, with only two appearances, both in Nove Mesto and Contulakti, it's it's crazy to be suddenly part of the elite team. Yeah. So it was quite a shock for me, but uh, I'm very happy they decided to give me a chance. Yeah, but uh, out of those two races, you also had one win in the Master at 60, right? So <laughs> quite a good yeah, in the Yeah, in the RB Cup, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, Stula, you made your debut uh, last season in Novo Mesto in the World Cup after the European Championship. And yeah, since then, your worst result was a 22nd place in the sprint this season in Conti Or oh, I think it's your worst result ever in your whole career. Um, yeah. At least internationally. And it was quite obvious that you might be one of the next strong biofleet after your first four races in the World Cup. But did you expect such a strong first season of you? Because I probably think oh. uh, that was a bit surprising for everyone. Yeah, definitely. Me included. I was, you know, I knew what my level was uh, last year. And mm-hmm. uh, my goal was to be better. But uh, I didn't know and I didn't dare to think that I was so close, you know. Yeah. That my shape has gotten so good. So I used the strummer to, to catch up to, you know, to, to the other guys uh, in the skiing. But uh, yeah. When the race started, I suddenly took another level, just you know, instantly. So it was crazy to see how my body is just you know responding to the races uh, being you know just around the corner, and uh, it feels like the body just awakened from a slumber, and now it's ready to race. So uh, it was uh, it was crazy the first week in Contulakti, and uh, the, uh, the skiing speed was out of. What, uh, anything that I've, you know, <laughs> wanted to dream of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and of course, the media also starts to recognize you more. Um, I think you're growing pretty strong on Instagram. Uh, you went from around 1,500 followers to over 17,000 in just two months. Um, are you still enjoying that uh, or is it getting too much and yeah, maybe too stressy? <laughs> no, Instagram is just for fun, you know. It's <laughs> always good with the support and I appreciate each follower, so... Yeah, I just uh, I use Instagram to to post about my races, both the goods and the bad, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, it's a platform where I can express my everyday life. So uh, the more follower followers, the better. <laughs> yeah, but you definitely. probably also get a lot of messages right now. Yeah, I try to answer, but uh, it's difficult to to answer all, and uh, mm-hmm. I hope that uh, my followers have uh, understand their understanding of that that. Uh, it's difficult to answer all the, all your followers' yeah. messages. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it seems uh, like you made a lot of things right uh, in the summer. You made huge improvements on the skis, um, and you are on average the eighth fastest skier at the moment in the World Cup. So, uh, what do you think uh, was the key to uh, make such such a big jump uh, in performance? 
I had uh, one goal when I was, uh, you know, qualified for the elite team, mm -hmm. and that was to be in as good a shape as possible in each training camp. Okay. So that was sort of my motivation to to be well rested when each training camp begins. So I I knew that I had a good chance of you know training with the others and catching up. But yeah, definitely the first couple of uh, camps were very hard for me. I remember the first session we had in in May. We were going for a long ski, and uh, the other guys, you know, they had low intensity, and I was like struggling to keep uh, keep up <laughs> with uh, yeah, high pulse. So it was definitely uh, some hard sessions in the beginning. But uh, after a few months, I started to take the level. And uh, mm -hmm. when we went into the autumn training and the more hard sessions, I was catching up, and uh, yeah, I even won some test races. So that really gave me confidence. So did you do anything special uh, or new in your training in comparison to your other preparations in the years before? Uh, mostly I did uh, what I always do. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have focus on the key uh, key sessions, what sessions are the most important. So, of course, the hard sessions are very important to, to raise your level. So these are like my, prioritize, uh, my prioritizing yeah, sessions. Mm. But uh, other than that, it's just, you know, to supply the training with uh, a lot of uh, easy training and to get the volume up. So mm -hmm. I trained a, lot, uh, a bit more this year than I did last year, but not crazy amount. Uh, so it's still manageable. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference in volume between you and like Johannes or Taye? <laughs> well, uh, I think maybe we're quite similar okay. uh, this year. Maybe I'm a bit behind, but I think I'm ahead of Johannes though in volume. Because oh. he's like, okay. he's, uh, he's not very fond of training uh, a lot in the summer. And he's just, you know, he's training more uh, when we're approaching the season. So Johannes is actually, he's not the strongest guy in the summer. But he, he's like, yeah, when the races are getting close, he's uh -huh. just, you know, he's finding a, a new shape and yeah, he's just awakening. Yeah, I think yeah. as a uh, genetically outlier, you don't need so much volume, maybe. Uh That's just, yeah, I think so. Yeah, really interesting. And also, the, yeah, this year he is like the first year as a dad, so I yeah, think he yeah. wanted to spend some time with the kid. And yeah, definitely a good, good call. Yeah, for sure. And it's also great to see how you uh, you improved on the skis. And I think it's not even your final form if you have in mind that you're only 23 years of age. So. Uh, I think with 28 or 29, you'll probably reach your peak. But what's also impressive is your shooting. So, Stula, you're the second best shooter in the World Cup behind Simon Eder with uh, nearly 93% hit ratio in the individual races. And uh, shooting always seemed to be one of your strengths, right? So can you describe what you need to have to become one of the best on the range? <laughs> I always uh, had a sort of talent for shooting, mm -hmm. uh, but I think that my talent is more because I'm uh, curious about shooting and shooting position. Mm -hmm. So I'm like in a constant uh, search for the perfect position, uh, and sometimes it gets too much. Like I can I can do changes in the season and just you know destroy my shooting. But this year I've been very decisive that when the season starts, I'm not making any changes. So that's a, that has helped me this year to to keep the shooting uh, good from the beginning. But uh, yeah, uh, I th I did a lot of good work when I had the sickness in 2018 because then I couldn't train physical. So yeah, I decided to instead of you know be mad that mm -hmm. I couldn't train, I would rather invest my energy in in the shooting. And I used also this time to study other athletes' shooting positions, uh, Marta Africa included. So. I made a huge uh, change on my rifle in this period and tried out some different stuff. And I think that gave me some confidence yeah. going into the following seasons. So uh, mm -hmm. what do you mean with uh, shooting positions? Is it like how you handle the rifle or how you position the rifle on your body? Yeah, like uh, where your where your grip is positioned, like in, in prone and standing, uh, how high your aiming equipment is and uh, at the length of the, the rifle, all this stuff will affect your, your position. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to achieve a position that is the most calm as possible. So you're not you're using an energy yeah, and yeah. You're, you can be relaxed when you're delivering the shots. Okay. And do you think it's a natural talent or just hard work in your case? With the shooting, I think it's because I'm a curious guy. I, <laughs> I like to, you know, I like science and I'm sort of a scientific guy. Uh, mm -hmm. In school, I was... Uh, enjoying math and phys uh, physics. So mm, yes. I think this, uh, yeah, that's maybe why I'm 
into you know trying to search for uh, the perfect position so yeah but uh, of course there's a lot of work also uh it's been many evenings where i've been frustrated at myself and i've been uh, you know disassembling the rifle and uh, trying to find a good position and then just using hours of hours with uh, tinkering and uh, small adjustments and then suddenly i'm i'm back where i started so uh, <laughs> it's also it can also be <laughs> too much sometimes Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say uh, I'm in a shootout tournament. I think you have it in the Blink Festival in Norway, right? And uh, I want to beat you and the guys like Johannes and all the other guys. So do you have some quick tips for me that I could use to maybe show you how to shoot properly? <laughs> well, I don't have a good track record in the, in the Blink Festival because uh, I'm maybe too slow in the summer. <laughs> okay. And my shooting is also, it, it can be fast, but uh, when I try to, you know, deliver confident and good shots my shooting pace it drops so yeah i don't i don't think i'm the per the perfect guy to ask for tips but uh, i think uh if you am at, try to have as little as movement as possible in your rifle when mm -hmm. you're reloading when you're moving from the top, next first target to the next target uh, that will really help your your shooting pace and your shooting speed yeah i think that's a good point because um you often see some athletes that struggle in standing shooting Yeah, they have a lot of movement in their rifle and um, yeah, I'm always thinking about, do you, when you do standing shooting, put the rifle or put a lot of pressure on your rifle and to pull it, pull it into your body or is it more loose, you know? Uh, I think it's somewhere in between. You can't really relax your right arm. You have to have a good grip. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you're too tense, then you can suddenly have strong movements and, and a lot of speed. So you have to balance the, the way of shooting with, yeah. At the perfect amount of pressure, but also the perfect amount of relaxation. Okay. Yes, Dula, not only your shooting is special, but also your rifle. Um, did you design it by yourself? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> this rifle I have now, I made it in 2016. Uh, or the, the structure, the main structure in 2016. So I've had it for a long time, but I'm always making small adjustments. So... Yeah, the well, one year I made uh, a huge difference. Like the year I was uh, having the sickness, I I just built some crazy stuff uh, <laughs> in front of the magazine well, where to <laughs> hold my grip too far ahead. Uh, and then you know the year after I had to remove it and build something else. So I'm uh, I've I'm been building a lot on my rifle, and uh, I like to you know try to to build some some new stuff and experiment so but after this season i will also make a new rifle or oh. i will make the same rifle but in a new condition because now it's tired and some some parts are uh, have cracks and yeah, it's just almost falling apart okay <laughs> and does that design uh, have a special meaning for you um yeah when it comes to the coloring um nah, not really it was just uh i was uh, toying with uh, with the, you know the paint job Uh, some years ago uh -huh. and i've been enjoying just to do, yeah, make my own uh, design so and yeah, the year i had the mononuclosis i came up with this design you know this tiger stripes yeah. and it was uh, green and yellow or it was dark green and gold uh, but this year i i wanted to go yeah have a, the same paint but with a thinner paint because the paint i used then was for cars so it was quite heavy okay. but <laughs> okay. uh, the paint i am using now it's more hobby or you know uh it's very thin yeah, yeah so it doesn't add that much weight and they didn't have gold and dark green green so I just okay then it's just green and yellow <laughs> yeah looks crazy and um let's have a look in the future and talk about the upcoming world championships in pokyuka it's your first world championships uh at the seniors i think at in the world cup uh, level and uh, now you are one of the favorites for the medals in every discipline i'd say so what are your own goals for your first world championships yeah like this was not something i expected before the season <laughs> so it's just a bonus for me to be racing but of course uh, after seeing uh, how i can perform when i have a good day on the skis and the, in the shooting i uh, i want uh, yeah i would say i'm <laughs> I would work for the medals. Uh, I hope to maybe catch one medal. It would mm -hmm. be very cool to take an individual uh, medal in the World Championships. But uh, it's still, you know, my first world, whole World Cup season, my first year yeah. on the lead team, a lot of firsts. So I won't be disappointed if I'm not achieving this. But uh, okay. yeah, 
I think it's going to be a cool experience and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, but goals change, right? Yeah, goals change. So yeah, yeah I said before the season, my, my goal was to uh, be as good so I wouldn't be sent back home to Norway uh, yeah. and, you know, maybe take some more 10 top 10 places. But now, you know, I'm one of the favorites into the world champs. It's just, mm -hmm. I have to pinch my arm. It's just uh, unbelievable. <laughs> Is there a race format uh, where you'd see your biggest chances uh, of winning a medal? Uh, I think I have to say the individual after taking a victory and a second yeah. place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's definitely one of the disciplines where I can really show my shooting skills. And also, you know, in 20K, you can take a lot of time in the, in the course. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the individual will be maybe my main goal. Uh, but of course the pursuit, I've done some great pursuits, uh, so I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I will uh, also look forward to the pursuit. Okay. Yeah. By the way, while we're talking about uh, racing formats, when we look at your mass start uh, races, it stands out that you had uh, your worst results here. Um, do you know uh, the reasons for that? Uh, no, I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I've been too eager in the last uh, mass starts. I've been being very in front and using energy. And I think uh, I'm not that experienced and uh, routine that I can just stay behind and save energy. So I think I have to be a bit more smart in the next uh, mass start and try to, to save my energy for the last loops. And yeah, I think that will be a better plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing a lot of pace in the, in the first rounds um, or in the yeah. first laps, yeah. I'm very, I'm very eager to race, you know, it's so yeah. cool to be in the World Cup and racing master. So, yeah. Yeah, you should <laughs> let Johannes run in front and uh, you just go behind, <laughs> if that's possible, at least. Yeah. So, um, but back to the World Championships. Uh, do you feel any pressure because of the expectations maybe of the Norwegian fans now? Uh, yeah, there are also always some expectations and some pressure, but uh, it's good pressure because uh, they know that I have potential and I know it myself. Mm -hmm. So I don't think anyone is expecting me to take medals in every discipline, but uh, I also know that if I have a good day, then it's possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I'm not. I don't think I will be affected by by the amounts of pressure from the Norwegian fans or the other fans. And um, how do you handle that mentally? Do you have some, for example, some cues or? I uh, I've been using a lot of meditation this last year yeah, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I did. Uh, yeah. Last season, I had uh, I shot worse in the competitions than in training. So I started this mental preparation work, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, suddenly I was shooting maniacally good. Like yeah, I was shooting good in IB Cup, and when I went into the World Cup, I was really, you know, at my top level. So I've also been using uh, meditation this year uh, to yeah prepare for the races and try to forget everything else. Like try to lay all other thoughts behind and uh, just focus on tasks so i think i will be using it uh, going into the world champs to really get that uh, high peak of my focus yeah. again yeah you always seem to be quite calm i think when it comes to races or also to the shooting range and uh, do you do that by yourself the meditation thing i i've been starting it uh, by myself yes yeah. um i have some audio files audio files from when I was like 13, 14 years old. Yeah. And we had this coach, he was saying, yeah, mindfulness is the key. You have to be good. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I didn't do any mindfulness or meditation. Uh, and I just had the files laying around. So and last year I dug into my archive and found those files and started just with, uh, with the basics. Yeah. But okay. now I just uh, do it uh, without any equipment or any helping Yeah, and help, helping audio. I'm just uh, sitting in my uh, bed or in my sofa and closing my eyes and just trying to focus on my breathing. And uh, it sounds very easy, but it's very, really, really difficult to, to manage to stay focused in like 10 uh, minutes, 20 minutes, or even 30 minutes. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good uh, practice. Yeah, could imagine that. Um, Stola, but now we talked a lot about uh, individual races and I'd say the Norwegian team is probably the big favorite for the relay gold. So the top four in the World Cup are four Norwegians right now. So the gold medal should already be safe for you, right? And <laughs> um, But your team had some troubles lately in the relay. So why do you think is that? Yeah, it's difficult to say. Uh, as I said, we're like top four in, uh, in uh, the World Cup total. So it should be a walk in the park. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy. And uh, I think uh, a lot of nations 
uh, are better at this uh, relay format because the loops are shorter mm -hmm. and you also get punished by having mistakes with the extra shots. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, we as a Norwegian team, we maybe don't get uh, the same advantage in the course because it's, it's shorter and we're also not the fastest shooters and not the most accurate. So yeah, the other teams have uh, really given us a good fight and uh, we only have one victory after for relays. So yeah, I think it's going to be close in the world champs as well. And uh, it's not decided before the start. Yeah. But do you think it has also to do with that you don't take the relay so serious or is it maybe also because of the high expectations of the fans in Norway? I think they always want to see a win and the second or third place is probably not worth for them. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, we'll, we do think that the relay are important. So we always try to, st to have the strongest team. So it's not that, that's not the reason. But uh, yeah, as you said, in Norway, we're used to be champions in, in winter sport, like in cross country, they're winning everything. Yeah. <laughs> and we in Vietnam want to do, do the same. So yeah, we, we try to reach for the gold. Maybe that's why we fail because we reached too, too far. So I think we just have to be focused uh, with doing the job and not thinking about the results. Yeah. I think Taya also mentioned somewhere um, that everything but a win in a relay doesn't count for him. Uh, is that uh, the standard of the Norwegian team? It sounds like uh, Tarai. So yes. that's definitely something you could say. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he's been in, the, in this game for so long. And yeah. uh, we as a Norwegian team, uh, you said yeah, we are like top four in the World Cup total. So we should be the strongest team. And we should be expected to to win sometimes. Uh, I don't think we can win all the time, mm -hmm. but uh, because uh, the other nations are also good at relays. But uh, yeah, it's definitely also yeah because the the expectations in from the home from the fans in Norway, they're maybe expecting more wins than uh, the other fans from the other nations. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, we just have to live with that and uh, try to do the best out of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you said you are not the, the most accurate shooters, but I think um, a penalty loop is like four misses at least. And I think that's pretty rare for you guys, also mm -hmm. uh, for the Norwegians. Yeah, uh, but yeah, suddenly you see all of us guys, we have the we have worse uh, hit rate in, in relays than we have in, in yeah. individual. So I don't know if the reason is because we're more pressured or if we maybe go too hard in the loops before the shooting. <laughs> uh, so we just have to figure out a better plan, I think, before the World Champs. Yeah. But uh, Stula, if you don't get any medal at the World Championship, I think there's still the World Cup for you and it's pretty close at the moment. So you and Johannes seem to be fighting it out till the end. And yeah, I know lots of medias also uh, asked you what you are thinking of winning the Crystal Globe. And yeah, you're still pretty humble with your answers, but do you feel you are ready to go for the Crystal Globe and for Johannes? <laughs> uh, I'm always uh, happy when someone tried to ask me this and compare me <laughs> with Johannes. For me, he's like another league. So yeah, I'm like the thorn in the side now in the beginning of the season because he hasn't had, he hasn't been on his top level. So I've been there to challenge him. But now we see that his shape is just incredible again. Like mm -hmm. the way he raced here in Antols, it seems like he's, he's back in, in business. So... I, I'm not expecting uh, to to gain on him for the last uh, part of the season, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a cool fight, and uh, I will do everything I can to to challenge him. But um, I won't be disappointed if I'm not uh, able to conquer the, the Crystal Globe. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Did you have any special events um, like the World Championships in focus with your training program? Um, Or did you just prepare to perform well over the whole season? Uh, I just tried to be yeah, well prepared for the whole season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did a lot of amounts in uh, both yeah, summer and autumn. And I didn't try to get a peak early in the season because I wanted to, if I, if I was good enough for World Cup, then I wanted to get in better shape. And yeah. if I had to peak my form to perform in November, then I would do worse in, in January. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was all, always the plan to try to keep up the pressure and with the training. Uh, and it seems like a good plan, but uh, I had, didn't really think of the world champs. As I said, it wasn't something yeah. I planned on, on going uh, because yeah, we have such a strong team in Norway. And uh, I thought uh, 
me as a rookie, I have no chance against, you know, uh, athletes like Vettel, Shosta, Christiansen and Alan Bjentegård. But uh, yeah, how the tables have turned. So yeah. <laughs> now I'm just uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. So there's still some energy left in your tank. I mean, uh, your shooting struggled a bit uh, lately in Antols. Yeah, I think there's still some energy. Uh, yeah. I was struggling, as you said, here in Antols. I'm not really experienced in the altitude. I think mm -hmm. it affected my shooting a bit. I had a good camp in uh, October in Lavatse uh, with the team, uh, where I shot very well in the altitude. But now I, I didn't seem to, to do the same thing. And uh, I hope that I can... Uh, get some good sessions here because I'm staying here in Antols and later in Obertilak before the world champs. Mm. So then I will be more, uh, more used to the height and altitude before the Pukluka. So yeah, that is uh, maybe my weakness now, my shooting in altitude. So that is something I will work on, but yeah, uh, I feel like my batteries are beginning to recharge again. And, uh, I think there is still some energy left in the tank. Great. So I think it was also your first time in Antols, right? Yes. Or did you do some training camps there? I don't know. No, I've no. Uh, never been in Antols. Okay, so yeah. I've, yeah, as I said, I've barely been in altitude. My first uh, race in altitude was uh, in Martel last season in IBU Cup. Mm. Then the next altitude experience for me was the camp in Lavatse. So yeah. besides these two <laughs> altitude uh, sessions, I haven't really been in altitude. And Yeah, in Antos, I've never been uh, in this part of Italy before. Or mm -hmm. El Avatze is not so far. So yeah, I've been close, but uh, not really here. Yeah, I think in all of your international races, you only had one race with five uh, mistakes and two races with three mistakes now, one in Antos. So that's crazy, man. And all the other yeah. races were better. But let's have a little recap of the season, Stola. You started with a victory in Kontjelachti at the first World Cup race. And you had a back-to-back -back win in Hofilsen with a sprint in pursuit. And you also won in Oberhof, where they say it might be the toughest track in the World Cup. So what's your most special moment of the season so far? Uh, it's difficult to say. Uh... Always, like, yeah, usually athletes say that their first win is the most special. Yeah. But for me, the win was just, you know, out of nowhere. I haven't expected it, so I was more shocked than happy. I was just, wow, <laughs> is this real happening? Uh, so I have to say that my second win in the sprint in uh, Hockfilsen, that was a bit more emotional to me because, yeah, then I did a perfect race. I felt really good in tracks. I was fast mm -hmm. in the shooting and I hit 10 out of 10. And also my teammates, they did really well there as well. So I, I didn't win because some other failed. I won because I did a good race yeah. and I got to share the podium with my teammates. So yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience that uh, was very emotional and uh, yeah, it's definitely something I will remember for the rest of my life. I can imagine that. <laughs> Stola, we also saw that your family seems to be quite proud of you, right? Yeah, I hope so. It seems that uh, to me as well. <laughs> yeah, there was a video um, of them uh, while watching you win Ho uh, Filsen and cheering for you. Is that something what you need? Uh, that strong background behind you? Yes, of course. Uh, my family means everything to me, and mm -hmm. yeah, they've been been there for me and supported me through my whole career, and uh, they always believed in me. So, yeah, seeing seeing how that I can make them happy and. Uh, Yeah, by racing uh, good races and giving them joy. It's just, yeah, it makes makes the life good and yeah, it uh, really helps me in my motivation. Mm. Yeah, Stula, but you're also leading in the U25 award and uh, in the individual and the pursuit disciplines. So you are wearing three bibs right now and uh, that means lots of colored bibs and also some extra money for you. So can you tell us the difference between going in a race with and without a bib? Especially for you? Yeah, uh, I didn't really, like the first time I did, it was with the yellow and blue bib. So that was, yeah, yeah. you know, quite an experience True, yeah. to wear the yellow bib. <laughs> and uh, my, my plan going into the race was to not look down because I didn't want to, you know, try to think that <laughs> I had an, another color on my bib. But yeah, in these, lists, in these last races, I really just enjoyed it because I think it's a cool bib and a cool color. And I have, now I have glasses that mm. is matching. So, yeah, I'm uh, enjoying having uh, 
having these bibs and uh, I will work hard to, to maintain the blue bib at least. Do you think it might also uh, be a difference to start in, in an empty stadium where no Biathlon fans are and then when, yeah, there will be crowded fans, maybe next year again, cheering for you and you are going with the blue or red bib or even the yellow bib maybe? Yeah, I think it's uh, definitely a, um, a bigger change when there's uh, fans around because Yeah, when uh, when when there's no fans, then it doesn't really matter if you have mm -hmm. a blue bib, a yellow bib, a red bib. But if when there's a, a crowd, they can you know see who is you know who who they are, and mm -hmm. they will cheer more for the yellow and the blue and the red. <laughs> so yeah, I I'm looking forward to to the crowds returning and. Uh, The guys in my team, they're like joking about uh, that no one knows uh, what the level Surlal really is because he's never raced with the uh, spectators. <laughs> yes, so yeah, I think yeah. when the crowd returns, we really see if I can handle it or if I'm just a fluke. <laughs> yeah, and um, do you already think about the future? Because I mean, statistically, you could break some records. I didn't find any big buy fleets that had similar results as you in their first World Cup seasons. Yeah, your worst result, we mentioned it was a, a 22nd place. Mata Fokat or Johannes Tingisbo or even Olaina Björndan didn't had those results. So is that something that already comes up in your mind? <laughs> no, I'm not uh, <laughs> thinking about that now. Uh, but I think my career is still in the beginning and uh, I have a lot of years in front of me. And uh, yeah. I think when you're approaching your end of your career, then you can start to really sum up what you did and uh, compare yourself to the legends. But now... Uh, it's my first year, as I said, in World Cup, and uh, yeah, I'm just uh, taking each day as it comes. And uh, I think uh, even to be compared to those uh, names that you mentioned is is an honor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, I think uh, a good mood uh, to don't get disappointed, right? Yeah, yeah. Stola. But when we make smaller steps, uh, next year we got the Olympics, um, so an individual medal there should be the goal for you right now. Shouldn't it? Uh, yeah, you never know. Like uh, biathlon is such a, a sport where everything can change, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it's it's not far from being in the podium and being out of top 20. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to stay sharp and do a lot of good training to to be able to take a medal in the Olympics. So that is what I will do in the summer. I will train train as uh, hard as possible and try to do the same uh, recipe as it did this year because it obviously gave some good results but uh, you never know like each each season opening season opening is still uh, very nervous and nerve-wracking nerve because you never know uh, if you're managed to keep the level or if you're getting worse or better yeah yeah i wish you uh, the best of luck for that but at the moment tell us where are you located with the team uh, right now in preparation of the world championships yeah now i'm in antols uh, i stayed behind with johannes dale mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. because we didn't want to travel to norway now with all the restrictions and covid uh, stuff so yeah. we're staying here for a, a small week until friday no saturday and then we're going to obertiliak where we will be staying until Uh, the Friday of the following week. So yeah, we will do some uh, this week. We'll just be calm and easy and uh, restoring some energy. And the next week uh, we will also be together with Tariai and uh, our coach Siggy is coming. So uh, yeah, the second week will be harder and more filled with preparations. And I think Johannes went home, right? And uh, so Johannes Tingsbø and uh, Tariai went somewhere else in Italy. Is that true? Tariai went to Saiseral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's having a vacation uh, <laughs> away from all biathlon, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Johannes went back to his family. He's a father, so yeah. I I can understand that he wants to yeah, sure. spend some time with his kid. Yeah. And Vettel is also in Italy still. No, Vettel went home. He he was planning on uh, staying in Obertiliak, but he's changed his plans uh, just a week before the World Cup ended. Okay. So um, you five guys are safe for the world championships. Yeah, we've uh, we've been uh, yeah we've got a message that we will race. Mm -hmm. So now we're just preparing, and if everyone stays healthy, then you'll see all of us uh, at the at the world champs. I think you got uh, five spots in the must start, right? Because of Johannes. Yeah, we have, but 
now Vettel he did a really good work uh, here yeah. in Antols to yeah. try yeah. to up, uh, improve his uh, World Cup rank total because you have yeah. to be top 15 to be able to race uh, in this mass start if you don't race all the races in the World ah, Cup true, yes. in World Champs. True. So yeah, mm-hmm. yeah we, we can have five guys if Vettel is still number 15 in the World Cup total when the mass start is, is uh, being raced. Ah, yeah, of course, he's out for the first three races. Um, mm. So, what is scheduled for you in the following days until the World Championships? Yeah, the schedule is, uh, yeah, as I said, easy training. And then uh, next week, we're having some test races and uh, doing some more work in Umbertilak. Test races internally with you, four or five guys? Yeah, me and uh, Dala and mm-hmm. uh, Tariai. Okay. Just the three of us. Okay. Yeah. So... Or maybe there's some other team at Obertilak. I haven't really checked. But uh, if there's like another national team, then maybe we can race with them. Yeah. And are you still alone in your room uh, as you were in um, Kontulakti at the beginning of the season? Yeah, now uh, we're keeping the guidelines. So yeah. Yeah. we're still isolated in each uh, our room. Uh, mm-hmm. And we're only together when we're eating our meals or in when we're training. Mm-hmm. So we try to to keep the bubble and uh, if anyone will get uh, COVID then we will not be so affected because yeah. we kept the, the guidelines. Yes. So um, what are you doing right now? Uh, do you have a second passion beside Biathlon? Yeah, I brought my guitar actually. So <laughs> I have a guitar laying around okay. so I can uh, play some if I'm bored. Uh, so that's really helped me this, this season to to have the guitar with me and to think of other stuff uh, and or not only biathlon. Mm. So it's playing guitar and meditation and biathlon and that's it? <laughs> I also bought a, a reading tablet because I, I like to read them. Ah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I started uh, reading a lot of Stephen King novels this okay. uh, season. And <laughs> that also seems to help because when you're scared, you don't think of biathlon. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so the shooting rage ca- can't scare you anymore, right? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm only scared of ghosts and monsters, not the uh, not shooting <laughs> rage. <laughs> Great, perfect. So uh, at the end, uh, we got a little section um, called questions that we always ask our guests. Let's start with the first one. Do you have any rituals before the start of a race? Uh, I have this meditation that I talked of so yeah uh, sometimes i do only meditation um for maybe like 10 minutes mm-hmm. and sometimes i do more meditation or maybe visualizing mm-hmm. uh with some dry, dry firing so yeah it depends on uh, if i'm if i've never been to the venue before then i maybe do more metal metal preparations but if i'm if i've been there before or if it's like uh one of the last races there uh, i can do less preparations and still be sharp and when you talk about visualization, you are going through the race or what could happen or something like that? Yeah, uh, the ideal uh, visualization that I've done a lot is you take your rifle on your back and you're mimicking the, the skiing technique with your eyes closed yeah. and you're, visualizing, <laughs> you're imagining going through the course. Okay. And each time uh, you come into the range, you open your eyes and you dry fire a series. <laughs> and uh, if I do it properly, then then the... The visualization takes as long as it takes to, to race. So I can like do this for 30 or 40 minutes if it's a long race. So yeah, yeah it's really, it's really a good way to to prepare, but it also costs a lot of energy. So I have to be well rested to do that. Yeah. So you stand in your room and you're going like uh, this with your hands or yeah. something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so um, what's your favorite World Cup venue, except of Oslo? Except for Oslo, oh, that's bad. Ah. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, I really enjoyed Hockfilsen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But maybe that was because we had such a good weather there. So, yeah. But Hockfilsen was, uh, with, the, with the tracks there, uh, it really fitted my, my technique. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it was a fun range approach. And uh, it was a nice, nice place to be. So, yeah. Until now, Hockfilsen has is, is been one of my favorites. Mm. But I think Antols is, is up there, but we have had some bad weather. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I have to experience Antols with only sun to, to say it uh, being the best. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I, Oberhof with a lot I've of been fog. been there too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Oberhof was better this year than uh, yes. it, it used to be. So it was actually quite good this year. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it there as well. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, your favorite racing format in biathlon? Uh, I really like the pursuits, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, I feel like uh, they're more uh, a challenge for a biathlete. You have to be good in two days, mm -hmm. like yes. both in the sprint and in the pursuit. Uh, and with the, you know, in this sport, it's so difficult to stay sharp all the time. And it's also, uh, yeah, there's such a small margin between being good and being catastrophic. So when you have a race in, in two days, uh, yeah. then you really get to see who is the best athlete and who is, you know, the best uh, biathlete. So yeah, the pursuits I think are the the hardest uh, and most uh, challenging races for a, for a biathlete. Uh, prone or standing shooting? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Difficult to say, uh, but I think I enjoy standing shooting more because mm -hmm. in prone it's just, you know, it's a recipe. You have to do this, 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 yeah. and you can't do this, this, this. Uh, but okay. in standing it's more, you know, the flow and the feeling and uh, the timing. So, yeah, you have to be prepared and you have to be sharp to to pull the trigger when you see the, see the black target. So, yeah, standing shooting. So you'd say prone is easy? <laughs> Not prone is not easy. It's yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, prone is very, it's very, uh, it's it's quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, but it's also quite easy. Like if you do everything right, then it's easy. But if you're making a, a small, a minor uh, bad decision, uh, like with the wind or when you're getting into position, yeah. then you can suddenly have five mistakes. So it's very, yeah, it's very cruel sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. What is the coolest thing about biathlon for you? Uh, the coolest thing is that uh, we have to, uh, the combining of the shooting and uh, the mental aspect. So you can't really go all out all the time because you have to prepare for the shooting as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're preparing too much, uh, then you go too slow. So we have to find the balance of, you know, going fast in the tracks, but also have the energy to perform well on the, sh on the range. Uh -huh. And what annoys you the most about biathlon? Yeah. Uh, what annoys like when if you get uh, if your rifle get uh, you know a, a push or something and your uh, aiming equipment is is moved. So if you get into the range, then you know it's all wrong, and you have no idea of knowing <laughs> if, if it's something wrong or if it's something you do. Yeah. Uh, so that's like the biathlete's uh, nightmare to. To have this experience at least in the relay if you go into a relay and the rifle has you know got a hit and uh, your aiming equipments are wrong uh, then it's just cruel i think you answered the next question already but until this point in time what was your favorite moment in biathlon uh, yeah i have to say the sprint in hockfilsen yeah that was uh, such a memorable experience and uh yeah, it was a perfect day. And I think you also answered the next question. It's uh, <laughs> do or did you have any role models in biathlon or maybe outside of biathlon, other athletes or something like that? Yeah, as I said, uh, Ola and Björndal, mm. he's been uh, an idol for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's been like a legend that I've looked up up to since mm. I was a child and seeing him on TV. And yeah, with the status that the winter sport has in Norway, uh, biathlon also is very popular. So. Yeah, definitely Olinar, but uh, also now in later years, I've really you know come to enjoy uh, and you know look up to at least like Marta for Cod, yeah. uh, the way he's been so stable yeah. all the time and the way he's approached the shooting range. Yeah, it's really inspired me, and uh, yeah, it's it's he was actually one of the athletes I tried to copy you know, when I had the sickness, because he's you know he's so strong and uh, yeah. I really like his way of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, shooting. Uh, yeah, in these last years, yeah. also Johannes Bo, yeah. <laughs> the way uh, he's really, you know, raised the level another step, and uh, you know, really at the, the skis as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think what he is performing now is just out of any league. Like I don't think we've seen seen the likes of it before. Yeah, yeah, your shooting looks pretty similar to Mata for cards, I think. But um, I think the next question or the next uh, quest might be pretty perfect for you because you could now put together the best biofleet in the world and it doesn't matter if he or she is active, inactive, a man or a woman, which attributes would you take and from whom? Yeah, uh, well, I have to take Johannes Bo's uh, skiing <laughs> because 
yeah, what he can do. Yeah. Uh, we've seen it times and times again, yes. how he suddenly can just increase the pace and uh, close a gap that is, you know, uh, unclosable. It's just, uh, you have to have uh, these uh, abilities to, to be one of the best, I think. And uh, yeah, of course, I've tried to copy Bart Afrikaad, so maybe my shooting is similar to his, but still he's the king, so I have to have to take his uh, way of uh, adjusting his shooting and uh, yeah. the way of approaching the range. Uh, he was a very flexible guy. He could like either try to push hard into the range to gain a gap on the others and shoot fast, or he could like fight with the wind or fight all the shots in if it was necessary. So yeah, he's just a, a very flexible shooter. And uh, I think that if you combine his shooting with Johannes, his uh, skiing speed, then you get an almost unbeatable athlete. Yeah, and probably. the only thing you're missing is the last 50 meters. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have to find the, the the fastest guy in the last 50 meters. And I think Vettel Schauser Christiansen is also very good uh, in this part. So yeah, Vettel's uh, finishing abilities with yeah, Johannes' skiing and Mart Afrikaad's uh, shooting. Yeah, mm -hmm. sounds strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still, I imagine uh, you had a big billboard in a big city and everyone can read it. Which message would you write on that billboard? Oh, that's a difficult question. But uh, I think that, uh, yeah, uh, if it's a billboard and it's in the city, then maybe chill down or something because, <laughs> yeah, it's easy to, to just, you know, uh, let the day go by too fast and not appreciate the moment. So. Mm -hmm. Chill down, enjoy. It's maybe the message I would try to yeah, try to go, uh, get out there. Yeah, and it might also describe your person uh, pretty well. So I think that are the perfect final words to conclude this episode. But uh, Stola, you could also tell our audience where they can find you if they want to know a little bit more about you. Like you got a website, you got Instagram, right? Yeah, I made a website now. Uh, it's called stolaholmlaigride.com. Uh, it's just in the beginning, so yeah, I haven't really gone to write so much about it in this website, but I will write some more posts and uh, it's also linked to my social media. So yeah, if you go on, on my website, you, you can also go to my social media in uh, Instagram, it's uh, Sturlov. And uh, yeah, it's also uh, able to contact me via email uh, and my address is also written there. So yeah. I think that's uh, the best way to go. Do you know where you want to go with your website? Like uh, what you want to write about? Oh, I know why. So <laughs> I need suggestions. Okay. <laughs> if you, if there's something you want me to, if any fans have something they want me to write about, then send me an email and I will get some inspiration. Okay. Yeah. Maybe about meditation or something. Yeah. Maybe. Could be interesting. Yeah. So Stola, thank you very much for your time. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And yeah, I think we wish you the best for the rest of the season for the world championships. Stay healthy and see you soon, I'd say. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. We hope you liked the interview with Stola Holm Lagreit. If you want to know more about Stola, follow him on Instagram or visit his website. But also follow us on Instagram and share this episode with your friends. All of the links can be found in the show notes. Thank you very much and till the next time. <laughs>